grace and peace to you in the name of our mighty, our almighty Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our story from Genesis today is one that is so ancient and has so many fantastical and mythical elements to it. A talking snake, a tree with a name, the tree of good and evil, a whole creation tended to by just two people, Adam and Eve. It can be so easy to only see this story or experience it like a dream. If you had a dream like this where you kind of hover above what's going on in the dream and you're just looking in, the story can feel like that a little bit. And the story is so well known, it's iconic, really, that it's been part of our pop popular culture for a long time. Actually, the oldest medieval drama in any language from the 12th century, it's called the play of Adam, a play that was performed at the cloisters in New York City a few years ago. This is, it's based on this story. It starts with this story. This play from a thousand years ago portrays the story of Adam and Eve and then follows them through their expulsion from the garden and on to Cain and Abel, and then makes its ways to the Old Testament prophets. Interesting, the play was almost entirely written in the vernacular language of where it was from in Anglo-Norman, a language spoken in Northern France and England. So this story has captured the imagination with those fantastical elements for a millennia now in the form of a play. And it's part of our own popular culture too. You hear the phrase forbidden fruit quite a bit, right? That's used in our everyday language to talk about things that um, we might find tempting or something we shouldn't do. Countless artists have depicted this story along with countless comic book cartoon artists too. I mean, who hasn't seen a cartoon with Adam and Eve and the snake? One I recently saw shows a tree with a snake wrapped up the trunk, holding an apple in his mouth, and Adam and Eve are looking on, and there's a yard sign in front of the snake that reads, do not accept food from the animals. So that's a pretty funny take on it. So there's a lot we have to shed, kind of, a lot we have to sift through to see the story for what it is. If we hover above the story like some sort of dream, or if we're watching the action only as an observer of a play, or if its familiarity has somehow numbed us to the truth of the story, we're really missing out. And we're missing out because the story is so deeply intimate to every one of us as humans. The story is about what it means to be human, which is our tendency to rebel against God by seeking out those things that we think will bring fulfillment or wholeness instead of God. That's, that's what happens here. Before we go any further, though, I, we do need to sift through it more and make clear that it's Eve and Adam that rebel against God here. We can't get caught up in the old misogynistic interpretation of this passage that paints Eve as the culprit and the usher in of all that's evil. We need to resist that and put that away. That interpretation is, of course, steeped in patriarchy and glosses over the fact that the text itself places Adam at the scene. If you look at your text, verse 7 reads, Eve gave fruit to her husband who was with her. He's there. He's there at the scene and fails to speak up or lend any aid or conversation to this whole, this whole situation. Okay, so with those things, we're trying to muddle through and see through, let's move back to what happens here. Adam and Eve are given all they need, cared for by a God who created them and had given them a place and resources to meet all their needs. God's given them no reason not to trust God, and yet they do. They distrust God. The snake, also one of God's creatures, taps into that distrust. I mean, you, I know we have some theater lovers, not just actors, but also appre appreciators of theater. This is great theater, <laughs> as any really human situation is. 
Hear it in the snake's first question. Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? Well, of course God wouldn't say that. God gave the trees for fruit to give. Of course he didn't say eat of, of course God didn't say don't eat of any tree. But the way the snake asked, did God say? It stokes suspicion. It's almost as if the snake's question could have been worded like this. Word on the street is that God told you not to eat of any tree in the garden. Did God actually say that? The snake stokes and pokes something in Adam and Eve, a mistrust of God that just lays under the surface. And they react accordingly. Eve says, God told us we can eat the fruit, except we can't eat of the fruit in the middle of the garden. Okay, well, she should have just stopped there. But the snake encourages that suspicion and he pokes at the distressed. And Eve continues and says, God told us we couldn't even touch the tree. But God didn't say that. God did not say that. He, God did not say you can't touch the tree. So all of a sudden, with their suspicion stoked, they're attributing something to God that simply isn't true. Simply not true. All because they had gone down this road of suspicion of distrust. And once down that road, we know this. We know this from the human experience. Once got down that road, there's just no stopping. It's like a freight train that just is hurtling full force toward rebellion of God. Distrust of God then leads to rationalizing of going their own way. You hear it in her words, well, the fruit is good for food. It sure does look good. It's delightful to the eyes and it will make us wise to boot. All these rationalizations. In other words, that fruit that God said not to eat will make us whole. It will bring us fulfillment in ways God just can't. And so they ate it, rebelling against God who had brought them into the world and had given them everything they needed. Now, these verses aren't in your bulletin, but they come right after this passage. They come right after this passage where we see the God who walks in the garden in the evening and looks for them. So right after this, where the Adam and Eve had made loincloths for themselves, this, this is the next verse. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and the wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? Don't those verses just make your heart break? They make my heart break. They're actually some of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. These words uttered by God walking in creation that God had loved and created, a God who comes looking for Adam and Eve. Now, God didn't have to ask this question, where are you? For God, as we as confirmation students know, God is omniscient. We talk about that big word, omniscient, all-knowing. God certainly knew where they were and certainly knew what had happened, that they had done what he had told them not to, but that what God had told them not to. And yet God speaks the words, where are you? Not for God's sake, but for theirs. So that they knew God wanted them, that God loved them still. And in that moment when Adam and Eve hear God's question, I wonder if they knew of their mistake, of their rebellion, of their unjustified distrust of God. In a play, I wonder if that might, if, the, if a camera might or a spotlight might focus in on Adam and Eve and you, you see on their, on their faces a realization that they might have learned the difference between good and evil, but they lack the ability to choose good over evil every time. That this trait, this characteristic belongs only to the creator and sustainer of life. The story of Adam and Eve is not the story of only Adam and Eve, of course. It's the story of you and me and all humanity. A story about our own human propensity to distrust God to hold on to a suspicion that God is not all we need. Again, as I say to confirmation students, 
There's a reason the first commandment is the first commandment because we get it wrong all the time. The God, the lowercase God that so often gets in the way is ourselves and our feeling that God, the uppercase God is not enough. Even as I speak these words, it's, it's hard to give a sermon on this text because the story really, it's a story you have to be in and live in. But they're distressed for their well-being, and so they go against God's command because they think they have a better way. We distrust God in our daily living, and we rationalize the way we treat others. We rationalize how we put ourselves first. We rationalize over and over and over. But our rationalizations can't change the truth that God only has the ability to choose right over wrong every time. God only has the ability to fill the void in our life. And as we see in our gospel for today, it's Jesus, the Son of God. It's only Jesus, the Son of God, who can resist temptation. Our rationalizations as creatures can't change the truth that God is only and ever the answer. And in the face of our rationalizations, God just kept walking with us, ultimately sending Jesus to deal with the problem of our distrust. The 17th century philosopher Blaise Pascal wrote of the human condition as one that has a hole in it. He calls it a God-shaped hole, a hole in our lives that only God can fill. Listen to his words. What else does this craving and this helplessness proclaim that there was once in humanity a true happiness of which all that now remains is the empty print and trace. This we try in vain to fill with everything around us, seeking in things that are not there the help we cannot find in those that are. Through not, though none can help, since this infinite abyss can be filled only with an infinite and immutable object, in other words, by God alone. As he puts it, by God alone, we simply cannot do it. And that's what our story, the story of Adam and Eve shows us. We can't do it. And so Jesus, as Paul reminds us in that very dense and packed Romans passage, and so Jesus had to come and he had to come to do it, to live a life for the good, the right was chosen every time. He lived the good and perfect life we simply can't. But it doesn't stop there with Jesus' life and death and resurrection. He walks with us in our walk of life in which we face tempt temptations constantly. God knows we'll get it wrong. Literally, God knows we'll get it wrong. But after every wrong move, God walks in the stillness of the evening, calling out to us, where are you? Because I am here. May the peace that passes all understanding guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.